just over a month's time, Sebring will play host to the third of the iRacing Special Events of 2018. Today, it plays host to round number eight of the iRacing Prototype GT Series, and it really does give us a good indication of who might be good at that event in a couple of weeks' time. Now, there might be no team racing today, but the thing is simple. 60 minutes, one pit stop, drivers have to go as fast as they can, but still work strategy to their advantage. 17 corners, 3.6 miles is the track length here today. It's 25 degrees with 38% relative humidity and six miles an hour, six kilometers an hour even, wind speeds on track. Welcome to Friday Night Prime Time here on Racebot TV, streaming live on iRacing Live. Qualifying is almost over. It's Wilmington along with Conor Maddock. Special comment from Racebot Cat over the course of this broadcast. And well, Conor, Sebring in a month's time will play center stage in the iRacing community. You might want to call this a bit of a warm up. Yeah, you would definitely do so. And maybe this will also play, um, you know, see how things will start to look like when we come towards iRacing special events. And you can see at the top of this prototype field, it is pretty much stacked when you talk about prototype drivers. You've got Tommaso Carla, currently provisional pole in that particular field. And uh, you've also got the likes of what's going to be Marcus Hamilton. You've got Fabrice Cornelis in the, throwing his hat into the ring as well. So this, the top of this prototype field is going to be very, very interesting indeed. Yeah, qualifying is over, and that actually means we get a chance then to look at your signing field for this event. And Tomas Okada will be starting out front. 1 minute 46.197. Patrick Wolf alongside him here tonight. Fabrice Cornelius in third place for Marcus Hamilton in P number four. That is in your prototype field with Cycler on back. And well, you made the, the correct assertion there. It really is stacked in this prototype field. We've got 12 drivers in prototypes. We've got ourselves... A few more in terms of GT1. GT2 field, only four drivers, however. Yeah, exactly. But uh, unfortunately, that is usually the case of things. A GT2 for GT car it isn't really all that popular, but there is still a, a select group of people that do decide to run that car. I know uh, Klopman, uh, the current pole, uh, vision, pole, actually pole position sitter now in that GT2 car. He has been racing this car for a long, long while. And uh, well, we, with that sort of lap time he's putting in qualifying, four tenths of a second faster than Zinkowski, he has a very good chance. Yeah, and there's a look again at the weather for this event. Not that much in terms of wind speed here today. Um, humidity is not going to be that high, so there is going to be overtaking opportunities in three different places. Down into turn number one, down into turn number six, and of course down into Sunset Bend, turn number 17 on this track. Um, but what we will often see is drivers really struggling to try and make passes on that middle section of the racetrack. And that's going to be really, in my opinion, Connery, where this race is going to be won or lost. We're just going to circle it for you on screen. I would say up about here on a run from basically the exit of the hairpin down towards Bishop's Corner. That is where this race is going to be won or lost. Yeah, it's a very difficult middle sector, as you say, to make passes. You can make something happen on the breaks down into turn 10, sneak one down the inside of 13, but it's very hard to, hard to hold position there as well. So, you know, even if you get alongside, it doesn't mean that you're always going to get the pass going into the sections. Yep, so let's have a look then at your field. They are lined up behind the Ari Singh safety car. Go on board. There was a driver currently on fourth, third place. For Reese Cornelius then. One full pace lap around this track. So in terms of fuel, this is probably more difficult than at any other track. I say outside of Road America now, Connery, and the fact they have to do a full pace lap, you're going to see a lot of these drivers really lifting and coasting all the way through. Yeah, exactly. Just try and save as much fuel as possible. It's, uh, it doesn't matter under a pace lap. You're not going to lose any positions. You're not going to gain any positions. You're going at relatively slow speed. So might as well just turn in all the fuel saving features that you have in these cars to try and gain an advantage in the pit stop. It looks like the pit stop window, it'd be about where you think it would be in the 60 minute race around about lap 20, lap 23 at least uh, for these prototypes as they start to head their way through the first sector now. And uh, well, yeah, a massive amount of fuel saving going on and this is a 60 minute race compared to some of the 75 minute races that you have in this proto gt season and what that does 
is those 15 minutes might not seem like a lot, but when the race is extended by 15 minutes at certain tracks compared to others, that makes strategy more important. 60 minutes here, it provides a wider window, I would say, Connery, for these drivers. What it does mean is we're more likely to have a lot of traffic coming on towards pit road at the same time. Yeah, exactly. It just means that the, all the same classes are on relatively similar strategies. So, it, as you said, it's going to be a very, very busy pit lane. And uh, uh, pit entry here could also be an issue, especially if prototypes and GT cars are trying to uh, come down towards the lane while they're in amongst each other all mixed up as well. That could certainly be an issue. Here's a look then at first place in your GT1 field. That is Dave Geeling in the number one machine. Alongside him is Mikko Numeri then. And that's going to be a fantastic battle, I think, we're going to have. And, and I'd say not only the top two, but about the top four or five in your GT1 field. Yeah, exactly. You've also got the likes of your pole position today. You've got Dave Haling versus Fraser Williamson as well. I'm excited to see how that battle uh, turns out. But yeah, you're right. Even further back in your GT field, you've got Nermi, as he mentions, trying to make his way back up through the field for uh, what is going to be at Black Star Racing there in that Corvette. And uh, it's great to see the Corvettes uh, getting a good run of things here. Of course, the difference between them and the Aston Martins is that they are very, very good at that low speed traction off the corners. It's really a point to the squirt car. And you've got to feel sorry for Timo Toika in the number 25 machine. In your GT2 field, only two, only three drivers have taken the grid. Two of them are from the same team, Vendebel Sim Racing, so it might well be the impossible task for Timo Toika. But the driver who's supposed to start first place in class, and Greg Gilbert, actually did not take your starting grid here this evening. So looking like he might start this one from pit road in the meanwhile down the very long almond straightaway this is where you enter the pass of a thousand sorry the corner with a thousand different lines sunset bend as it's Fabrice Cornelius you can see there in fourth place ahead of him oh, you got a couple of the drivers they are all lining up now getting ready to go Tommaso Carna and Patrick Wolf going to be P number one P number two your front row as we head ourselves to the green flag of this Proto GT, one hour's worth of racing for Friday night prime time. We are so glad that you can join us. The pace car pulls on towards pit row. It is go time for your left-hand lane. They're stacking up a little bit, actually. But now, Carter puts the pedal down and the green flag will come out. Three wide as they head themselves in towards turn number one. In your prototype field, they settle it down just a little bit in towards turn number one. They should all make this through. They're not too bunched up. And indeed, that is going to be the case. They are all okay in terms of your prototype field. And now we just wait for the first of your GT1 cars to come through. And they, Ooh. as well, Connery, were okay. We've got a car off in prototype. Yeah, we do have a car off indeed, as there was a little bit more free wide that we saw on the start there. There was uh, Neil Andrews and Paul Ilbrick getting themselves in Volco through the first sector. Three wide through turn number two, and Ilbrick trying to make something happen on that inside, but it did shove Evers out to drive, which is the car you saw go off onto the grass. Yeah, and Evers, as a consequence, go on board him again, down to P number eight. Now, the thing at the start of one of these races is you can lose more positions than you gain. That is a situation for Frederick Evers right now because he has lost quite a bit of time and places at the start of this one. In fact, now he's down to P number nine in this event in class already, and that is not the start he would have wanted. Tommaso Carlo does lead away right now, though, from the driver of Patrick Wolf. The gap is about half a second between those drivers and behind in GT1, where Dave Galing does still lead away, and he is a four tenths of a second ahead of Fraser Williamson. Not yet talked about the GT1 split here today, but it is a case of all aboard the Aston Martin train. Yeah, pretty much Aston Martins. The entire top three are Aston Martins. But look at that P number four, Marian Babrak there in that Corvette. So the Corvette can run quite comfortably at the front with these uh, Aston Martins as long as they're put in the right pair of hands. But Babrak looking to come under pressure here, coming in towards Sunset Bend. Seal's just going to sit inside that slipstream. Will he look down towards the inside? He will look down towards the inside. But is it just a look down into here? He has to commit, but no, no commitment. Meanwhile, we've got ourselves to Maso Kana, as I say, leading the way still overall as they are already onto their second lap of this event. Apologies for the special comments then from Racebot Cat. As we say, she is in heat, so if you have got a nice male cat who would like to take Lola to the dance, then please do let us know 
battle going on in GT2. Well, there is no battle. It reminds me a bit of the 90s, like the 2005 United States Grand Prix there, Connery. You yourself two drivers in teams running together, one from another team running just a little bit further back. Although, I would say we've got some really close race going on. P4, P5 in GT1. Yep, exactly. And this was the battle that we saw coming down into Sunset Bend. Babarek in that Corvette trying to defend from Paul Seale. It did make it side by side off of Sunset Bend last time. By is deep on the brakes goes Paul Seale, almost collecting the back of Babarek there. And this brings Paul Antcliffe back into things. It does, as Antcliffe now might get the run as they come down. Nice. He won't be anywhere near close enough, so they're coming into Tau Tau Corner. Here we are. Yeah, as they come, Martina Racing Machine, not gonna happen. Battle for third place in your prototype field. That one's also looking close right now. This is with Patrick Wolf versus Fabrice Cornelius as they work themselves through towards Le Mans. Turn number 16 on track and now onto the Ullman straightaway. And well, Wolf has got a half second advantage over Fabrice Cornelius, although they have both lost a second already to Tommaso Carter. Yeah, exactly. Fabrice Cornelius, of course, in the uh, sports car open. That Van der Waal team winning the uh, prototype championship over Thrustmaster Movano. But it is Movano that leads at the moment in the form of Tommaso Carla. And also Patrick Wolf involved in this one, P number two. Of course, he is usually a pure racing team. But for sports car open, he actually raced for the Sim RC uh, team. But he's back in his usual colors, still fighting at the front. He is indeed. It's just having a look through your battles that are going on across your three different classes. Live timing and scoring, by the way, is available. Just visit racebot.tv forward slash timing and we'll keep you up to date with everything that is happening on track. But in your top three in each class, it's kind of settled down early here. And that's the thing about Sebring. The traffic will come into play later on we might have at certain other tracks. So on board right now, the Paul Ilbrink in your prototype class. It's hunting down Neil Andrews. That is the closest battle we've got going on realistically in terms of prototype. And actually a good run by Ilbrink. This could put him to the outside as they head themselves now into Cunningham Corner. And he's going to actually go to the outside into Cunningham Corner. This is Paul Ilbrink. Of course, he's a very experienced driver. He's run in the RS World Championship Grand Prix Series. He's been a part Ooh. of Radicals' online effort in endurance racing. But he got very squirty there through Collier Corner. Very squirrely is one way to put it, as he got himself all over the kid. Cart starting to break traction, had to back out of the move. But can he gain another position for Radicals Online right now? Of course, they did uh, win the 24 hours of Daytona in a little bit of, well, controversial circumstances, shall we say there, Will. But it's a win's a win, and they're looking to try and maybe not get a win this time, but at least get a top five as he has to run into Sunset Bend. One, He's going to have a quick little look, but no commitment again. Yeah, one of the more controversial finishes I think I've ever seen on an iRacing special event. But as you say, at the end of the day, the win was the win. Radicals Online beating Vendabelle Sim Racing on the final lap of the iRacing 24 hours of Daytona 2018. Of course, you can find all the highlights of that on the iRacing YouTube page. We've gone forward right now with fifth place in your GT class. That is Joost de Vries there in the number 27 Corvette machine. So we have got one or two Corvettes in your field here today, but they do seem to lose out a little bit in that straight line. But it's been overall, the lap actually compared to the Aston Martin is still worth noting as well. That Timo Toika, get this already, he's fallen back seven seconds from the rear of your Vendabelle train. Yeah, that is, yeah, that, that's, that's just the way the Klopp and Sankowski like to do things. Uh, and they are incredibly, incredibly experienced in these GT2 cars, even though the participation has fallen off, of course, uh, they still remain pretty, uh, pretty cut fast and committed to that machine. And uh, let's just hope things get better for GT2 cars. But it doesn't look like with, uh, with the amount of content that is on our way, Will. Well, yeah, GTLM, LMP1. We've had the announcement as well as the changes that are going to be happening to the IMSA series and also in terms of the kind of multi-class racing that we have. Actually, it's going to be great, I think. Uh, I'm going to call it the Road to Le Mans 2018 because I think that's going to be the pinnacle of this year's endurance series. Yes, we had Daytona. That was your warm-up. But now we're on that road to the 24 hours of Le Mans. And we remember we talked, Connery, to a number of teams and drivers that said the Daytona 24 hours was their, their essentially their test session for what that GTE and GTLM cars can actually do. Yeah, exactly. But of course, we still had the uh, the, the, the Daytona prototypes yeah. involved in that one as the prototype class. So 
uh, once these LMP1 cars do get released, then everyone is kind of on a more of a le level playing field there. And I'm, I'm excited to see uh, who, which team rises to the top of that class. We can take very, very good guesses, but we no won't know for sure. Yeah, you can put a number of names in the hat for us in X Racing. We like to bend about in racing. CMRC.E, Kroanik Central, Radicals Online, Apex Racing UK. That is just the first part of that. Of course, Core Sim Racing, Core Motorsport can all come into that one. Team Redline, can they bounce back after a historically bad 24 hours of Daytona? You go on board actually with P number six now in your GT1 class. Carlos Villa in the number 13 machine versus Justin Breeze. Um, the middle pack here of your GT1 field, it's kind of in limbo right now. We're doing that typical thing, Connery, of running about seven times per second behind the driver ahead of them, not wanting to get into that dirty air, not really wanting to battle too much. Not really wanting to battle too much at all. There are cars that are catching there. Villa is catching uh, used to freeze by about a tenth of a second. The lap and uh, Mika Nimi is trying to pull away from them. But yeah, these gaps are just fluctuating in and out, but they're not close enough for really any side-by-side -side action. And guess what? It is three Corvettes in the middle of this field. So there's three Aston Martins, three Corvettes, two Aston Martins, Corvette, and two Aston Martins that comprise your GC field. As Reese goes deep on the brakes in towards turn, num turn number seven hairpin, but he's still way too far back. He is indeed a fantastic shot there by some of these drivers coming through. What is the run into a turn number? Let's work this one out. That was in towards and cunning in corner, actually. But I do love this track. And actually, the thing about Sebring as well, which is really difficult, is that you've got the two different kind of like track surfaces as well. That really does play havoc with some of these drivers as they can get the balance right for about 90% of the track. But actually, from the big braking zones, when they're in different asphalt or sorry, concrete to asphalt, it does make things very difficult. Yeah, it does, does make things very difficult in terms of the setup. Of course, you, uh, another thing related to the track service is the kind of bumpy nature at some parts of this track, especially in Sunset Bend. Hit a bump all wrong, and all of a sudden, uh, the car is very, is very, very upset with the way it's been handled and can spit you out into a barrier somewhere. So you just have to be careful. Just careful with the throttle inputs, careful with the brake inputs, and make sure you get through these uh, bumpy sections relatively okay. On board of Frederick Evers versus Pascal Sticks into Carney, into the hairpin even. Turn number seven on track and the gap between them, well that's static at a third of a second right now. Oh, but let's go back, oh, Fraser Williamson, he's gone off and he's out by the looks Aww. of it. Replay, let's go. Hard breath failure. Yeah, technical issues there for Fraser. Nothing else you can say. Yep, I think so too. I don't think this. I'm just having a look at the onboard, trying to see what happened. Uh, there's no abnormal input to the steering wheel, shall we say? That's a very weird instant. It's a huge, huge instant as he goes barrel rolling almost down in towards turn number one. But so I always get yeah. the bridge even. That's what I meant. Yeah, that would have been an even, even scarier instance, and thankfully all of this is simulated, so Fraser Williamson will be okay, of course, but the thing is, what won't be okay is his run in broadcasted races. One race win, but everything else he's DNF'd in. Yeah, it's almost as if he's doing it just to make issues and things, things bad for himself, but we have got this battle going on. P2 overall, P2 in your prototype division. Patrick Wolf versus Kareem Cornelius. This is going on right now. And I will say, in terms of the ongoing development in LMP1, I'm going to be the first person to say, oh, I'm actually glad LMP1's come out now, not two years ago, because these drivers have had so much development time in the LMP2 car. I think it's actually helped the formation of teams who can really tackle the LMP1 car when it comes out. Yeah, exactly. We had the introduction of team racing a couple of years ago and the extended endurance racing calendar with driver swaps and everything. So, yeah, it's given these guys a lot of time to try and get their stuff together. And uh, Vendaval and Pure Racing Team want two of the very big players indeed in your prototype field in any series that they race in. Pure Racing Team currently leading the endurance series, uh, Neo Endurance Series. But uh, Vendaval Sim Racing winning the Sports Car Open. And uh, the future is looking very, very bright for both teams. And having a look at the lap times as well, there's not much between them. Fabrice in the number two car was able to gain a couple attempts, sorry, a tenth even, 
in that Vendor Sim Racing car. He's lost 1.6 tenths of a second over the course of the last few laps. That is absolutely nothing to choose between these drivers. Uh, we've just had about 15 minutes of this race called complete. I want to go back and have a look in this GT1 train because now it starts off with Mika Numeri there in third place and then one, two, three, four, four cars, five cars there, right there in that train. They split up a little bit from um, Carlos Willio down to Paul Antcliffe, but uh, as Antcliffe tries to have a look down the inside as they work themselves through a cutting kind of corner, it does seem to be that they are all just doing the truly train, shall we say. Truly train indeed, and I've received a little bit of a message from Fraser Williamson, and uh, well, he said, it's only a hardware failure if you count his brain as hardware. Well, there we are. So driver failure for Fraser Williamson. <laughs> I can get away with it because he said it and I didn't. Anchor though, right on the rear of Carlos Villa. This is what P at number five in Clark. And I think Anklis realized he's got to get a move on, otherwise he's going to lose this draft. Yeah, exactly. That's what he has to do now. And we've seen potential moves happening towards Sunset Bend, but can it happen again? Going to sit in the slipstream for now, look for the good exit out of the corner, because through the middle of this corner, this Aston Martin's going to be so, so strong coming through the middle and through the exit. They'll be relatively competent as well as he tries to get the traction down. Careful not to push too wide there. And Dancliffe, as a result of pushing a little bit too wide, he's going to lose the momentum all the way down towards turn number one, but potentially close fighting ahead, starting to develop between Nermi and De Vries as well. Thing to note here, Connery, in this Aston versus Corvette battle is that in most cases, the Aston's always going to win because of the fact, yes, we do have some long straightaways, but you end up in a situation that before that, you've got a series of slow to medium speed corners, and that's always going to be to the Corvette step. Oh, here we go, but the thing is, Villa did break himself <laughs> down into the hip. It's so close coming off the exit there. But yeah, I completely agree with you. The defense of that Corvette is basically the traction off the corners and coming off the slow speed corners especially. And uh, well, lo a lot of these corners around Sebring really place the advantage of the Aston Martin rather than the Corvette, uh, like you mentioned. So this is going to be very, very difficult for Vila to hold position here. Yeah, let's give you an update on GT2. Nothing's happening. Same as it was before. Team Toyka, 26 seconds behind your class leader. Moving on, let's go back and actually... This is where it's going to start getting interesting here, Conry, because your top three drivers are now starting to go through the GT2 traffic. Yes, there's only three of them, but it might well be enough just for now Cornelius to get side by side and walk. It could be enough as they have one more GT2 car to try and negotiate. There's also a uh, GT1 car that has been uh, uh, stricken a little bit. James McCritchy uh, is currently there. It's down towards the inside, goes Wolf on the traffic. Puts one bit of traffic in between himself and Cornelis here. And Cornelis is going to get held up a little bit by his That's teammate team, there. And Cohen Klopman, yeah. But, you know, in Bovesio and New Endurance Series, uh, the event of all the team with the them oh. south bit lap traffic as Cornelis gets a bit of the grass a little bit of half spin as he carefully doesn't hit the wall there but wow that was that, that was interesting I, that was an unforced error yeah it was on board let's have a replay I'm assuming he caught uh, I'm, I'm sure he did he caught the white line on corner entry I want to have another look at this one from our overhead coverage brought to you by And One Design, the official graphics partner of Racebot TV. But I'm just going to zoom it in. And I think I know exactly where to pause it for the first kick. For the, yeah, just there. Coming into, you just see that he just has that wheel on the left-hand side just touching both the white line and the grass. That's always going to spin you around at Seabrook. Yeah, exactly. And uh, as I mentioned, it was basically an unforced error from uh, Cornelis. He has to work those ones out before the uh, for the Sebring special event race here on iRacing. And uh, right now, he's dropped him back through the field. He's going to be about P number five in class. So the two cars ahead of him, both for us, Marcus Mervano, Marcus Hamilton, Philip Bauer. And uh, this is going to be a bit of a challenge. Van Rolf versus Mervano again, again and again. Yeah, indeed. So, so having a look then. There is Cornelius down into P number five right now. 
Let's go back and have a look, though. And we haven't talked about the leader in class yet, but Dave Geeling, what a run he is having, that number one machine right now. He's gaining basically anywhere between about uh, two thirds of a second a lap, which actually at some point 1.4 seconds a lap over everyone else in GT1. Yeah, absolutely insane pace there from the Vendor Sim Racing driver. It's not quite showing up uh, correctly there, but the thing is, this, uh, it's going to be Vendeval leading GT1, Vendeval leading <laughs> GT2. It's just Cornelis. Come on, let's go and lead prototype. Yeah, indeed. So it's good. Well, it's going to be a long road now for Cornelis to get himself back out front. Now, strategy will work if you manage to make it here because he's only 7.2 seconds behind your class leader, and a lot of this will come down to what will happen during pit stops. He talked about this already, Connery. The pit road actually opens in about two minutes time. It's a wide pit window here at Sebring because it's a 60 minute race. But a lot of drivers will try and just cut this race in half or go as long as they can right to the end and then just do a top up. Yeah, so we'll be seeing a bit of mismatch and strategies as Connors. He's done it again. Well, he's, well, not exactly the same instant, but he seems to have a, quite an affinity for the grass there as he runs wide coming through the first sector. That's just weird, but coming back to the point, these prototypes, round about lap number 2023, where we expect the most of them to come in, but uh, again, it's going to be such a wide strategy field to be playing in here that it's going to seem like a mismatch. We've got a close one going on. P3, P4. Oh, it was a close one going on. This is what we've been talking about. It's two Corvettes in this situation. And actually, two Corvettes is actually even harder in terms of the dirty air sometimes, the way these cars work. They're heading themselves right now through turn number 15, left-hander, in towards Le Mans, turn number 16. I do not understand the track numbering at some point in this track. I've said this thing about a number of North American tracks. Turn 15 incorporates a right-hander, and then a left-hander, and then a very short straightaway before turn 16. Yeah, exactly. And it's, you know, with the heavy braking zones in towards the hairpin, in towards turn number 10, you could make it side by side through there. But the thing is, De Vries looking to get the good exit off of Sunset Ben, not quite getting it. And he's going to have to wait at least another lap to make a move in towards turn number one, perhaps. But he still has a couple of more opportunities uh, here to try and get himself past his, uh, what can we say, like manufacturer, manufacturer teammate here in the Corvette. Yeah, indeed. So as Race Spot Cat continues to say hello, we got actually going, going on board for a few moments. We have Josta Freeze there, number 27 machine. This is Race Spot TV fan immersion. It's always interesting seeing when you've got this multi-class racing, how each of the different cars react. But just having a look at um, back up in your prototype field, Cornelius is falling back even further. Um, but then you've got the situation, Paul Ancliffe actually right now, battle with Carlos Willia in towards Sunset Bear. In towards Sunset Bend, they go on coming through the exit of Sunset Bend, they all come as well. And Villa is going to uh, get the position here over Paul Ancliffe, heading their way across the line. Already gets a couple of tenths of a second gap uh, to be able to deal with as well. But looking back towards the prototypes, it's going to be very, very, very short amount of time before they start lapping the rest of your GT1 field here. Well, yeah, it will be indeed. We're going board actually with Ancliffe right now. You can see the gap. That is a Corvette ahead of him. So. The thing for Ancliffe is, he's going to be faster through this section, but unless he can force Villa off here, which he's not going to do, he does get a better run, however, it's going to be very hard for him to make the move in towards the hairpin. He's going to prove me wrong, though, as he do so, because down to the inside, actually, Ancliffe will go. 
Is he going to make this move stick? He's going to try his hardest indeed. Yes, he does. We're here again then. We'll come to 13 right back on the attack in that Corvette C6, 67 even. As uh, so they'll come through the kink there, side by side again, in towards Cunningham Corner. And Ancliffe here has also now got himself prototype traffic. And that, I believe, is one of your leading cars. Is that Tommaso Carter himself? Oh, yes, yes it is. So Tommaso Carter is saying, hey, guys, get out of my way. Yeah, he has to split up the battle, no ifs or buts about this, because he's got Patrick Wolfhart on his heels as well. And uh, they, he will get himself out to a relatively okay, so that spell is negotiated and Via can start to try and close up yet again but I think Via got lost out the most in terms of that GT battle but the thing is here comes Patrick Wolf down the inside of the Mon will just take the position uh, no problems no questions asked there as down into Sunset Bend he'll get the other one but uh, that has really worked out in the favour of Carla and Antliff yeah it has so you have a look at that Comparable lap times um, between the two of them, but that last time all went down to Ancliffe. Although you've got to keep an eye out now. On oh, okay, 27 machines. Like you know what? I'm going to come on towards pit road because I don't want to be overtaken by these prototypes and lose time. This is an interesting strategy here, Conry. But you can make it work, especially if you're Corvette, where you're normally slower in the corners, especially if you're offline being lapped through traffic. Yeah, exactly, and he'll have no problems going to the end here. Of course, they mentioned before that this pit window very, very wide, so coming in with about 36 minutes to go, that's just going to get you to the end here as he just waits for the field to go in. No tyres taken, of course. That'll take way too long with how short the stops are, with how little fuel you have to put in here since they're not full stint. So out and away goes Yusuf de Vries. And let's just see where he goes out. 17.3 seconds on the lane. He'll come out in a little bit of clear air once again. Ultraeus gets past. Yeah, and Stefan Overgaard is on pit road as well. There is Stefan Overgaard indeed coming out. Actually, he's done one lap already. So Josta Freeze is ahead of Stefan Overgaard, as it seems. The two drivers that have made actual pit stops. You have Fraser Williamson, you saw that car on pit road. And Marian Brabeck as well. He is fast as out of the event. Only four drivers out. Timo Koika, by the way, has retired from this event. Yep, so the field of four GT2 uh, cars has now become a duo dancing out there on the racetrack quite far apart. Uh, part is, uh, what has happened to uh, Timo Toika, in fact, the number 25 car? Is it some sort of technical issue? It must have happened quite a long ago. He might have just got a little bit bored here, yeah, which... Uh, uh, well, it's not what you want to see, but sometimes you can't understand it when there are only uh, two other cars in your field. Yeah, indeed. Uh, and of course, let's not forget, by the time that we started talking about him, a few uh, about 10 minutes ago, he was late 26 seconds behind your leading duo. So knowing the fact that, you know, he's not going to come any higher than what he is, reserve your safety rating. And actually, that is a strategy that sometimes we see in Proto GT. It's not always a, a strategy that people agree with. It might be frowned upon by one or two people. But if you're not going to gain anything else, then, you know, what you might be able to preserve your safety rating. And again, especially at a track which is very narrow, very bumpy, which has a, a history of throwing up the unexpected. Yeah, exactly. You might as well come in and, uh, and conserve what you have as we have a, a couple of other cars down on towards the lane. This is Miko Nermi and Carlos Viet, so two of the other Corvette. There's also uh, going to be, what is, uh, actually no one as a retired pro Corvette down on the world's lane there, Mario Babarek, as Nermi will get himself off his stalls relatively okay, and Carlos Viet will do the same as well. So it seems like the Corvettes are the ones going for the early stops here, Will. They are indeed. As 40.4 seconds end to end there for Miko Nermi, and actually, look at him versus Jost of Ries, and I think actually, that was a bit of a strategic decision there, knowing that the Aston Martin behind might well have been... Oh, actually, no, there were two Corvettes. I'm going to take that one back. But I was going to say, I think that he was realising that the undercut could have been played there by Jost de Vries, but, well, actually, all of a sudden, Jost, again, is looking at bright yellow. Yep, exactly. And again, no way by. He's going to have a, you know, show the nose down in towards the hairpin, but that move definitely isn't on. And uh, there's a prototype also looking to try and come through in the, in the not too distant future. That's Gabriel Perez in the number 22 machine. So, uh, what is the strategy play for Nemi? What is the strategy play for De Vries out there on circuit now? Because this pit stop strategy has worked itself out. So, this is all on track now that they, they have to do it. Yeah, and the only thing they're going to have helping them at some point along the line might well be a little bit of traffic like what we're seeing right now and this is 
Um, I think the number four machine, it was, no it wasn't, it was someone along the line that was trying to overtake all these drivers. But the prototype traffic is going to be a key factor here today. That might well determine when people come on towards pit road. Let's go for your top eight in each of your classes. Tommaso Carter is leading the way by 1.6 seconds right now over everyone else in your field overall, but especially of course in your prototype field. Second place is Patrick Wolf. Third place, Marcus Hamilton. He's now dropped back to seven seconds behind your leading duo. Philip Barr in fourth place, Fabrice Cornelis in fifth. Paul Ilbrink, Neil Andrews, and Frederick Evers round out your top eight. Over to your GT1 category, and we'll see that it is leading the way. The driver of Dave Keaton, he's already leading that field by 20.6 seconds over Paul Searle. Paul Ancliffe is in third place with Calvin Ford in fourth. Josta Vries in fifth place. Sixth place is Nick Numeri. Carlos Fuller in tongue and Stefan Overgaard runs out your top eight. And then finally over to GT2. Well, there's four of them. Now there's two of them on track. Great win there, Vedavos in racing. Well done. Yeah, exactly. And I wonder if, uh, you know, I could uh, try and ping them in their Discord, just telling them to, you know, give us a little bit of a fight at the end here, guys. Come on. Yeah. Uh, Samasa Carter, the gap between himself and Patrick Wolf is now 1.6 seconds. And you're talking about the fact that Wolf was close. Actually, Wolf has gained the last two laps. Let's have a look at Carla as coming across the start finish line will come the number three machine. And it will be a lap time of. Come on. 147.454, that's about three tenths slower than previous lap. And again, Patrick Walt takes a bit more out there. Gap down now to 1.483. Yeah, so Wolf basically looking for this late race charge that uh, he is definitely very capable of pulling off. And uh, is this just Carla just trying to manage the gap or is he actually at a uh, lap time deficit to Patrick Wolf? We'll see in the next couple of laps if he starts to reply to the pace of Patrick Wolf as uh, Marcus Howell behind. He's not really catching either. He's pulling out the gap over his teammate of Philip Bauer, but the Bauer, Bauer, Bauer and Cornelis, they are almost identical in terms of lap time. Yeah, and the gap is only four tenths for a second, actually, between Cornelis and Burrow right now. And this is where pit stops can really come into your advantage if you are the driver of Fabrice Cornelius. Of course, he had that incident earlier. It might cost him about two and a half seconds on track, if not a bit more. He's now 10 seconds behind your own for a race leader. That might be a little bit too much to gain back over the course of the 30 minutes of this race that we have remaining, of course, plus the final lap, as we now are officially halfway through on time. But for Cornelius, he might well be able to gain one, maybe two positions on pit road if he nails it properly. Yeah, that's what he has to be looking to do now. We've had a lot of your GT1 uh, cars come down towards the lane, mainly the Corvettes. We're still waiting for the vast majority of everyone in this field to hit the pit lane at some point in the future. 20 to 23, the prototype pit stop window, the usual pit stop window. Of course, the actual pit stop window is quite a little wider with the fuel that they have to take, but that is the usual range that we see in previous races as Philip Bauer has to go around the outside of Dave Halink there and outside again on the exit. And look at how this has helped Fabrice Cornelis. Now he is right onto the back. Not going to make the move into a turn number one, but now he can just sit in the slipstream, look towards the inside. But I think that's a little bit too far back, even for you, Canales. Yeah, indeed. So, if you have a look at the speed chart, don't forget live timing and scoring is available on racebot.tv forward slash timing. And you can get a social list on Facebook forward slash racebot.tv at racebot.tv on Twitter. I'm going to have to make sure I don't do too many Super Bowl posts this weekend here, can yeah, we just have to be very, very careful, and uh, it, it's the uh, it's the same with the the month of May as well. Will is uh, we, we're starting to come up to it, so I'm starting to get a little bit worried. Well, the thing is, as well, we've got to remember that iRacing's office is based in the state of um, Connecticut. No, it's not even Connecticut, isn't it? Massachusetts. Massachusetts that's the one. Um, but what I'm worried about is the fact, of course, if we try and go for the Eagles, we might have our contract lost. Yeah, exactly. We don't want to have that happen. So our hand is very, very forced. Yes, it is indeed. So go Super Bowl. Although there's a fantastic Amazon Alexa advert, which um, dropped the, uh, the other day as part of YouTube. They do this amazing thing these days. We're just putting all the commercials into one place. If you don't actually like football, but you like the commercials, just go and watch them instead. As Rico Nimri versus Justin Vries, that one continues 
battle for P3, P4. Two Corvette drivers, Joost de Vries there from Club Benelux and Nikkei Numeri from Club Finland. You know one thing, Connery, I think if Benelux had more drivers in the service, they could well challenge to be World Cup champions. Yeah, exactly. It, it, but in, in terms of the effort from them in the past couple of years, it hasn't really been there for them. But if they can really get this user base involved uh, in the events like the World Cup, then they could be a scary, scary threat uh, in, in terms of that one. But uh, their roadside will be very, very competent. It's The only thing I worry about is their oval effort, uh, which there are a couple of drivers. I think uh, Frank Van Brandwick uh, there's a lot of oval. There's also another one I can't quite mention. That is very, very well known in the uh, in the NASCAR iRacing series uh, sort of races that go on throughout the year. But uh, you know, if you have a field of two oval cars, then that's not going to be much for World Cup where you need 10, 20. Yeah, I am actually going back to Belgium this year for. Uh, in fact, I'm going to Club Benelux twice because I'm going to the Netherlands, and then also as uh, Frederick Evers. Almost runs into the rear of Neil Andrews down into the hairpin. Going, of course, to the six hours of Spa. That is on Bank Holiday weekend in the UK. Which is, I'm just going to be honest, Nicole. It's just my way of getting out and commentating the 24 hours on the Nürburgring. Yeah, exactly, and uh, we, we still have to sort of uh, get some, a little bit of payback for that every year, but uh, uh, there we go. It's the driver that I was thinking of uh, in terms of oval drivers for uh, your Benelux Club, and that's Jackie Lotterman as well. So the East of Speed Sports driver, at least in the Sports Car Open, very, very good on the ovals, and actually used to be my teammate as part of the Apex uh, Academy team for oval. Yes, indeed. And uh, Apex, of course, one of the teams that have struggled in many years over the 24 hour, 12 hour special events here. But they're one of the teams I'm gonna say, you talk about the month of May a month ago. I think they're a team that's to watch there, a team to watch in Blanc on this year. And I think that they can do their own in terms of special events. We've seen flashes of brilliance recently from the Apex Racing the UK team um, across all the series, of course. We just won't talk about Sebastian Thurman uh, right now, I mean, a different team now. So we're definitely not yeah. gonna be talking about that one. I'm still stuck in my old mind. Um, but they've been fantastic, of course, in the proceeds of road racing. Yeah, of course, they've, we've got uh, Alex Simpson, the team boss, actually winning uh, that overall Pro Series uh, with a little bit of help of, from uh, uh, Joshua Rogers and Freddie Rasmussen, uh, being very secure and not having to race the final race, or final two races. So it's a little bit of a lucky sort of streak for him. But the thing is, he's there and he deserves it, actually, because even though he didn't get the race wins, he was top three, top five every single race. And you just can't fault that. You can't. Talk about lap 23, by the way. We are three laps away from that in terms of your prototype field. It's time for a GT2 update. They're still going. Klotman and Nielsen Kowski for Vendorville Sim Racing. They are still there. Back to GT1. Definitely They're still out there driving. Yeah, they are. <laughs> there's not a lot we can say. We do apologize. There's not a lot we can say when there's only two drivers in the field. But you know what? This is the good thing about Vendorville as well. They really have evolved as a team over multiple disciplines over the last year, year and a half or so. And this is why we can joke about them now being, you know, just dominating in GT2 or two drivers because of course they had the heartbreak in VLN, which is well documented on this thing called the Sim Racing Observer, Connery. Yes, of course, but that that is more of a more of a Jake Sperry thing than the Connery Magic thing, even though I do help out with hosting the website and making sure uh, Jake doesn't break anything with it, but uh, there we go. <laughs> it, 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 uh, it's true, it's, it's, it's the honest truth. Uh, Stefan Overgaard versus Carlos Villa, they're still going off for P number six on track. Uh, it's just around them as well. Uh, there's actually now a free horse race between Philip Barr, Fabrice Cornelius and Paul Ilbring, P4, P5, P6. And this is going to be an interesting one heading in towards Pit Road. What happens if all three come down at the same time, Connor? Will one team maybe try to just underfill by maybe a you know a click and see if they can make it it could potentially be the strategy player that starts to come out here it'll be very very risky indeed there's not a lot of time to be able to make up uh, to do a lot of fuel saving here with what is going to be even less than 20 minutes to go uh, when we are through with the pit stops for these prototypes as the pit window is well and truly open but no one in your prototype field has come down on towards the lane just yet everyone on their 20 lap stints right now coming up to 21 
It could be this time or next time by we'll start to see some action on the pit road prototypes. Yeah, and there is Philip Barr. We're out on board from the rear of him. As Luis Cornelius is about eight tenths of a second back. And actually, it does seem to me that Burr is better when you're in that middle section of the race track compared to those around him. Stefan Overgaard right behind the driver of Carlos Villa right now. And in fact, so that was Claire, I take that back, that was Calvin Fordland who was alongside. And it uh, looks as though that Calvin is going to be able to get back past on the run in towards Sunset Ben. Indeed, he does. Number 24 machine. Let's get ourselves a quick replay of that one. Because um, this was two wide racing through Le Mans down towards Star. Oh, that's what happened. Okay. So that was actually the number 14 machine of Stefan Hovergaard going off on the run down to Le Mans. And that's why he lost two places there, Connery. Yeah, a little bit too greedy on corner entry. He has to push wide, get collect those one X's as well. As actually, we do have prototypes on the lane. Marcus Hamilton, Paul Ulbrick, Neil Andrews, Frederick Evers, all down on towards the lane, all part of this group that we saw. Yeah, here's a replay then from Calvin Ford. Just seeing him working himself past the number 14 machine of Stefan Overgaard. But yeah, the drugs on pit road. Here we are. Marcus Hamilton. Let's have a look then as drivers will come off pit road in a couple of moments' time. Hamilton, as we say, is on the lane. Andrews, Ilbring, Evers, all at the same time, like we worried about. Hamilton will get out first. Then it will be the case of Paul Ilbring, then Andrews, and then Evers, by the looks of it. So it's very close, actually. Look at that, side by side. There's a prototype ahead, but Andrews is going to lose out there in that battle. He's down two. Yeah, he will. So side by side off of pit road. Uh, it's, uh, it's, it's, uh, very exciting to see, but not so exciting for the drivers when the pit road exit is so narrow going through those green cones. But uh, they managed to negotiate relatively okay as we're still waiting for Carla, Wolf, Bauer and Cornelis to head their way on towards lane C with Pascal Stix as well. So this one isn't over yet. We'll see where Philip Bauer and uh, Cornelis slot in in this particular battle. Vendorville Sim Racing, number five machine, has made a pit stop in GT2. 17 seconds there from Nilsson Kowski, 40.9 overall, and Cohen Klopman has not yet hit it. Klopman right now working himself through the north end of the racetrack by the looks of it. As we turn our attention back to Carter, and he is on pit road, as is Patrick Wolf. Now, Carter has a 2.1 second advantage here, Connery, but with Wolf coming in at the same time, that's Carter thinking, uh oh, uh, don't want to mess up. Yeah, don't want to mess up. You have to get your car stopped in your pit stall absolutely perfectly. No ch no running a little bit wider or a little bit forward. And he does get it stopped. No having to reverse back into the box for either of these drivers. There's Cordellis and Philip Bauer coming down on towards the lead as well. And they get stopped. Well, Cornelis was very, very tentative. Off and away goes Carlo, though. He will retain the race lead. Go off the way goes Wolf as well, as there was about almost a second difference between those pit stop times there between those two drivers. Off goes Philip Bauer ahead of Rubis Cornelis. And where will they come out in relation to the cars behind Mark and Marcos Hamilton? Just coming down the pit, pit uh, straight here. Side by side, it will be down in towards 10 and 1. Careful with the rejoining off of pit lane here. And Hamilton has got both of them. He has. So Marcus Hamilton then up into third place. Good run by him then in that number six machine. And all of a sudden, Marcus Hamilton is becoming more of a factor in this event. But Luis Vanillis, by the way, remains in P number five. So could not do anything for the sequence of his club, but still there behind the driver of Philip Barr. Yeah, he really needs to do something daring coming down onto that stop. But I think it was a standard stop. Uh, for Fabrice Cornes, uh, at least on my time in screen, 13.8, Philip Bauer, 13.9. Marcus Hamilton, actually the longest of the group of three cards, 15.2, but he still managed to come out ahead. Yeah, indeed, so this is the battle going off the fourth place in your class. Run through then, the standings overall in just a couple of moments of time. It's already calmed down in your top five in GT1, Connery. Mikko Numeri now, as I say, behind just for, uh, just the Vries. I say that, Paul Ancliffe is on pit road coming out of pit road and he will be very close actually amongst a number of other drivers I think no he's come out behind Numeri and he's come out pretty much in clean air to be honest yeah exactly it was going to be potentially close between himself to Vries and Numeri but uh, Numeri did manage to get the gap uh, over Paul Atcliffe so that is the uh, kind of visual gap that we're working with here or at least Paul Atcliffe is going to be working with to try to get himself back up 
uh, to inside that top four in your GT1 field, but still it's a three car scrap. Two Bivano, one Vendaval for your prototype uh, P number three here. Absolutely nose to tail as they head down the pit straight in towards turn number one. And what for base called Alice do here? He has a wall of, front, is, of his rival. He has a wall of uh, Bivano ahead of him. And how does he get over it? Well, yeah, indeed, it's behind, actually. There's a battle going on. And it looks like the Villa's going to lose position there to Stefan Overgaard. Not much going on between these two, but it is pretty close overall, actually, as we have a look through. Three drivers separating now by half a tenth of a, uh, sorry, half a second. It was half a tenth of a second. We'll probably be a bit more excited than what we are now, but here is a driver, a Calvin Freudant. He is sixth place in class, and Overgaard is in seventh, and then Carlos Villa rounds out your top eight in classifications. And well, we need to give you an update here that Cohen Klopman has made a pit stop in GT2. He's come out in 41.8 seconds, Connery. Yeah, absolutely fantastic work from the pit crew there, shall we say, to get that GT2 car service with uh, no one uh, really to be battling with. It's maybe a little bit of pit stop practice uh, for that pit stop crew as uh, Senkowski dealing with a little bit of traffic coming through on him. Uh, that is pretty much the only thing to know on GT2. Right, let's have a look then through your standings as we've got ourselves just over 15 minutes remaining. And Carter has eat that lead out, and that's because of the pit stop there, Connery, to uh, what? Um, 3.2 seconds. He said he gained a second. And that's pretty much what that one second was. Yeah, exactly. Gap up to 3.3, where it was around about two. So uh, Patrick Wolf needing to do a little bit more work in this final stint. But the thing is, by my calculations, as he heads his way across the line, there's going to be about 10 laps remaining with 16 minutes uh, left on the clock. So not a lot of time at all for Patrick Wolf to work with. He really needs to go now. Marcus Hamilton, third place in class. For Philip Bart in fourth. For Brees Cornelius in fifth. Ilbrink, um, Evers, and Andrews running out your top eight. It really has kind of died down, though, in the prototype field ever since pit stops. We have got Hamilton, Burn, Cornelius, but that one's seeming a bit static despite the gap being close. Yeah, exactly. He has just uh, gone into a little bit of a lull in terms of that one. You, yeah, you used to be some Dermy are still close in your GT1 field. I mean, in terms of everywhere else, uh, Evers and Andrews, they are relatively close, but I think I could expect that Frederick Evers will be starting to pull the gap at this stage. That is my honest opinion. But the main battle that you're looking at is three, four, and five for prototypes. Yeah, and to look then back in your GT1 field, Paul Ilgren, we uh, can see there that like, he's got a lead of 23 seconds over everyone else. Just the Breeze versus Nico Nimru, that is still your closest battle at four tenths per second, but it seems to be again, neither driver can actually put away from the other. Yeah, it, it, it's just stagnant, and it, it, it's sometimes uh, the way these races fall sometimes with how equal the drivers are, with how equal the setups are on these cars, as they push a little bit wide through Sunset Bed, but of course, as we mentioned every single time we mention it, it's a car, it's a a corner that you can take multiple lines through and you'll be relatively okay even if he does push wide on the tree. Yeah, he's a little bit closer at our stop in this line, but you know, a quarter of a second not a lot to write home about as you come down through turn number one. Both drivers going below the yellow line there, right close towards the wall, but Miko Nomi loses about a tenth and a half there through the first corner alone. Maybe Connery, we set that car up more to work in a straight line, even more so than they normally would compared to the corners. Yeah, that could definitely be the case here. It's uh, one of those tracks that you can make over the sort of higher downforce side of things work and the lower downforce. So typically, drivers look towards the lower downforce uh, here with the very long back straight. You've got the pit straight. You've also got the run down from 13 down towards uh, 15 and the long quarter as well. So it's uh, it, it, a little bit of battle of philosophies here. And I think uh, Eustace de Vries is currently uh, starting to win, at least on this lap. It did close two tenths of a second last time by. I think the Vries has started to reply. Yeah, he is. And then, of course, to have a look at your results so far in your GT2 field. There you are. Seven seconds exactly it was. As Racebot Cat wants to give her own comments. Hi, Racebot Cat. Back to you, Conroy. Hello, Racebot Cat as well. There we go. That's all I have to say about that one is uh, this battle does decide to head its way through uh, towards Le Mans for the 24th time. But the thing is, this prototype battle still very close. But the thing is, it, there's nothing really that Conroy could really do about this. He actually lost 
around about three, four tenths of a second on that last lap. So something must have happened, like pushing wide there or having just to uh, slow down a little bit there with lap traffic. But the thing is, he can't be affording to losing that much to be losing that much time. It looks like he has gained it back over this past lap though and he is definitely within striking distance of philip bauer now as they head towards sunset bend too far back to make a move down towards the inside here but set yourself up for a run through here he does push a little bit wide but the thing is he can cut back and try and get the pace off of the corner here and make the move down into towards turn number one but a very good run for bauer is gonna mean that that move is a little bit more impossible and the thing is that gap you know the way the draft seems to be working today doesn't really favour people, but this is the chance. Oh. Corvette there getting in the way a little bit through turn number one for Philip Burr. That allowed Cornelius to be really close right up, but he's only really two cars deep, so two cars wide at that stage of the race track. And Cornelius blows it all there on the run through Big Ben because now he can't get close enough and towards the hairpin. Yeah, and he has to deal with the traffic on the entry to the corner in the braking zone as well. So he's going to try down the inside anyway and spook uh, that Corvette car over uh, into locking its brakes and falling back behind. But now this has also uh, brought Paul Elbrink back into things here if they continue to fight much longer. Uh, a 147.4 by Ilbrick that last time by. That was on pace uh, with the prototypes ahead of him. But this lap is going to be absolutely horrible for both Bauer and Von Ellis. So uh, Paul Ilbrick may be a huge factor now. Yeah, let's go on board with Ilbrick for a few corners. Overall, though, you've got to say that it's all great here. When Cornelius and Burr are hooked up there, going through the um, Ulm and Treadway, Ilbrink was falling back. A little bit of traffic on the exit at Sunset Bend, that's a bit of driver. But Cornelius, was he had that good speed earlier on, but ever since that kind of half spin, he's kind of not really shown much pace for it. No, not at all. I don't think it's any damage issue because the thing is, he didn't really have contact with any other car, any other barriers, so. It must be some sort of tyre issues there because the, these prototypes would not have taken tyres in the pit stops because of the short, uh, the very little amount of fuel that they're going to be taking on in the pit stops. So these are the tyres that these cars did start on. And uh, well, if he's put them through a relatively uh, abusive heat cycle with that spin, then that could be the issue that we're dealing with here. So perhaps some increased tyre wear for Canales. Behind in prototype, we still got the driver of Neil Andrews versus Frederick Evers. This is the P number seven overall. But I'm just going to say here that Andrews has been trying to put the pressure on, but the lap times show that it's hit and miss between the two of them as well. As you can see there on your screen, Andrews versus Evers currently scored at three tenths of a second. In GT1, there are no more real battles going on there, Conway. No more real battles apart from potentially via an overguard here is the uh, via two tenths of a second last time by that is actually the closest battle that you have there out on circuit and uh, there's also Foydrin that might drop back into this one as well so it's not all over in terms of battles uh, for your GT1 field but all of the action is in prototypes less than 10 minutes to go Ooh. we've got nine minutes to go what's happened Oh, Bowen got severely held up coming towards Sunset Bend. And this could be the opportunity that uh, Cornelius needs. He's so, so close. And their way across the line here. And it's going to be aggressive. Defensive inside line for Bauer. Cornelius has to go the long way around. Around the outside. He can do that here. There's a country mile of space out there on the exit. And Cornelius gets the position. Textbook move there by Fabrice Cornelius. Replay of that one coming up. And you're almost going to start there back on the exit of turn number 16. But here's a fantastic look then. We're going to go on board with Von Burr, and here we are. And he's actually lost another plate away from our screens as well. Cuts back to the outside, down into Sunset Bend. And that really stacked up the entire three drivers there in prototype. We have got to say, we're going to keep it on this replay. It will bring his pass as well now. 
Yeah, exactly. So losing two positions in such a short space of time is uh, very, very hard to take. As yeah, you're completely right. Elbring did manage to make up the position. And I think that was down to down coming through Big Bend, I believe, that he managed to gain that one. So uh, that is the state of things right now. Both the Venerol and Radicals and Lionheart did manage to get past ah. the Thrust to Ivano machine. But the thing is, they start to have to start to chase down Helmsland now. And there's a big R from our very lovely Wilbert. Yeah, and what it was, and Racebot's cat here is trying to explain it at the same time. What happened to Philip Barris? He got very wide on the exit of turn number five. Now, there's a technical reason why he might have done that, Connor. He's been basically running in clean air for most of this race. As soon as he gets behind a car, of course, you know, in terms of dirty air, downforce your car has, it will change. And then Philip Barris, as a consequence, I think that he just put a little bit too much wood into that. And because of that, Ulbricht's gone for us. Like, you know what? I'm not taking any more chances. I'm going to drop back two seconds down behind Paul Ulbricht. Yeah, he's just going to try to start to park the bus now, I think, is Philip Bauer. The next competitor down the field is actually going to be his teammate of uh, Frederick Evers, a good couple of seconds behind. So with five laps to go, I don't think uh, that Evers is going to make up that much of a gap. So I think uh, Philip Bauer is relatively safe for where he is. Of course, he could start to try and catch up to the back of Paul Ulbricht, but the thing is, that gap is a little bit too big, I think, as he... Again, he gets held up coming through the first sector here by a uh, GT1 car. It's Paul Seal there. He has to go around the outside at Big Bend. But uh, that is uh, kind of, uh, you know, it was a spurt of action. And now it's kind of uh, fizzled out the battles of prototypes. It's actually called S. Runs a little bit wide coming through turn number seven. That car is not happy at all. It's not, but it's now in fourth place. So he's up a little bit. Let's go back, though, to your GT2 battle. For those of you joining us, well, there's two GT2 cars left in the field here today. Tim Adoika um, decided that he's going to call it quits um, after nine laps of racing. Um, in fact, probably that's the car actually. He's down to score in the laps of racing. Uh, and Gilbert in the number 28 car did not start this race. So Vendabel racing one, two there for the number nine and number five machines. And I think they're going to probably stage this finish. I'm not lying to you. Yeah, I definitely think so too. So we'll see exactly uh, what will happen there. But uh, the close battle in the entire track right now is currently Foydrin versus uh, Stefan Overgaard. Overgaard caught about a tenth of a second the last time by. So we have that to potentially look forward to at the end of this event. We've also still got Evers and Andrews that are relatively close as well. So we might need this stage finish for DC2. Yeah, and the thing about Overgaard, of course, as well, he is in a Corvette compared to Calvin Freudent in an Martin. Um, this is where the Corvette should gain a bit of time, but it's not really, he's, not, he's getting a tenth, tenth and a half a second. And we'll have a look at the lap times past the line, but this, you are right, is the closest battle on track. And Overgaard, can he gain anything as they work through the final two, final corner, Sunset Bend, with just under five to go? About another tenth of a second. Yeah, a 156.2 for Overgaard, a 156.3 uh, for Foydra as the head their way through turn number one. And this is so, so tricky, especially on the first lap with many, many cars in the bigger endurance series. It just, it's like a funnel. It starts being very wide in the middle uh, and on the entries of the corner, but it just funnels everyone into a basically two to three lane uh, sort of situation coming through the first sector. We always see incidents coming down through there. I wonder if we will see the same uh, when it comes to the Sebring 12 hours in uh, not too distant future. Yeah, and of course, that'll be here along with all the other main iRacing special events this coming year on iRacing. We've got to say as well, actually, three new World Championship Series and now the iRacing lineup. We've got ourselves one in the Global Rallycross and two in terms of the World of Outlaw Series. Now, we're under the impression at this stage, kind of, these might be a little bit smaller in terms of the number of races they're going to have, especially in this first year. But it's great to have dirt, road and dirt oval all being recognized for World Championship Series. Yeah, and I th definitely think they should be as well. We need to get as many uh, disciplines of racing having their own top tier series, uh, at least in terms of uh, high racing sanctions uh, series on the service. And I know the Dirt Oval guys have been asking it for a long, asking for it for a very long time. Before but dirt I think I racing out. feel before Dirt even came out as well, yeah. But I think uh, I racing wanted to get all the, the a lot of more Dirt tracks that they had on release, and now that they have that. 
especially with uh, the, the chili ball coming as well. I wonder if they'll put spring cards and uh, lay models on that instead of just the midgets. But uh, uh, yeah, I think Iris can feel comfortable now. They can run a fully flesh pro series uh, for both your late models and spring cards. We have got a battle going on in GT1. Paul Sale versus Joss De Vries then. Through turn number three, four, and five. And I just want to have a look at the lap times here because this one's appeared on our radar pretty quickly. But Joss De Vries all of a sudden has caught up Paul Sale. Maybe, and I'm having a look at the pit stop times here. 17.1 seconds for Dave Geeling. 17.1 seconds for Joss De Vries. 15.2 for Paul Sale. Maybe that number 12, Club UK and I Machine, is running a little bit on the light side and is wide about running out of fuel. Yeah, that could be the case there. Is, uh, it was the shortest, uh, one of the shortest stops in the entire GT1 field for Paul Seal. The only one that uh, comes even close is uh, going to be Paul Ankleif, which is actually another Aston Martin as well. So uh, that could be the situation that's going on here. But the thing is, there's a prototype trying to go through. That's Pascal Stix. Actually has to back completely out of the move coming down towards turn number 13 tower here. And he's going to make that move on the exit here. And he's going to split up the battle. So, uh, you know, just as the battle starts to emerge, it starts to be taken away again. But if the situation is as we expect, when Paul Seal might be running a little bit light on fuel, this will come down to what I'm going to show you right now. Tommaso Carla is working himself down at... We need to go on board and really see what part of the racetrack this is. So this is on the run down into Big Ben. So we will see one more lap after this one um, for, for Tommaso Carla. So maybe Paul Seal here is in a situation. He feels as though he'll make it to all the zeros, but might not make it through that final lap. Yeah, so he has to be so, so careful here. Careful not to run wide out of Sunset Bend either, as he almost clips the grass coming out of there. But uh, let's see the lap times. 155.737 last time by Fasil, and 155.9 uh, for Eustace DeVries. So it's actually faster than Eustace DeVries there. So, but we know why. It's... Yes, of course. So it's... Uh... <laughs> It's, DeVries, he's going to have to really work at it now. He might be gifted the position if Paul Seal is, uh, can't manage his fuel to the end as he gets a slide coming out to turn number five, uh, coming through to, to number six now. But uh, DeVries, he's going to have to find the gap here somewhere if, just in case, that Seal can make it to the end. Yeah, and I think that tank slapper as well. Um, by oh, Seal, he's going to lose this one, I think, almost on the run down in towards Cunningham Corner. I mean, it's a better run there from Seal on the exit of the corner. But it looks like he's over break. He's either got tire issues or fuel issues. But here comes the number 27 machine. Holds the inside line. Late breaking there by Seal. He's really trying everything to defend that position. But I do think that it's going to be a very, very poor case here. And maybe Seal running out of fuel. And now he's in that situation where he can't try and save fuel. So, <coughs> sorry, as the time expires, the white flag is out here at Sebring and we've got a bit of drama for silver medal position maybe a bit more if Seal does run out of fuel overall yeah we'll just have to see as uh, uh, yeah we are on the final lap here for the prototype so we're going to go to about uh, what is going to be 33 laps on the stint for your GT1 cars and some of them might not have even planned uh, for that amount of laps. Usually they, uh, they might plan for a little bit less uh, because they're not used to seeing these big names running the series with the pace they've been running but so close coming through uh, Sunset Bends right up under the bumper, under the diffuser is used to freeze but the thing is he's not going to get the runoff. Yeah, Tommaso Carla however has not got long to go. We can just see that flicking it to the left into Collier Corner. Turn number 11 on track. We're keeping an eye out, by the way, what is going on at the same time in terms of P number two, P number three in your GT field. We'll put the top three in each of your classes up on the left-hand side of your screen. Tommaso Carter has got a 1.5 second advantage over Patrick Wolf and is heading now down towards Ullman Shrineway, picking up that pace towards Sunset Bend in a moment's time. De Vries, we're just going to keep it with him into this corner. Nothing yet. So we'll go back now to Tommaso Carter in towards Sunset Bend for the final time in that prototype machine. Tommaso Carter will be your winner overall here for the GT round number eight at Sebring. Tommaso Carter will score the victory and a well-deserved one by him. Patrick Wolf will come home second in class 
And then third place will be Marcus Hamilton in just a few moments' oh, time. As what's happened? Colas has lost the position in the final corner to Paul Ilbrink. Ilbrink will actually be P number four. And Cornelius then down into P number five as a consequence. Josta Vries now only has one more chance. Maybe Paul Sill has been able to hold on here. Josta Vries isn't very, very aggressive on the noisy pedal either. Let's have a listen in. This is battle going on for your silver medal position in gt1 looks like paul seal might well be able to hold on as he'll come through the final corner for the final time this is when it all will become true and yeah indeed paul seal is going to hold on he will claim second place but not without a bit of a hurry up towards the start finish line it was dave geeling of course who won in terms of your gt1 battle so dave geeling then claiming the winners position in gt1 and time for a surprise cohen clockman wins in terms of gt2 connery yeah i've just noticed frederick evers just creeping his way across the line this was running a little bit further up than when he fit it where he finished p number 10 runs out of fuel so these cars were marginal to the end yeah we talked about how one or two of them might well have been here's a replay with frederick evers he was out of fuel before he even came into Sunset Ben. He's not the winner. Might be the winner in terms of fuel conservation. But Frederick Evers then, he was coasting for a long, long way. And actually, I want to see where that really started. Well, that was all the way back. All the way back, actually. Let's go on board Evers. So he had fuel into Bishop. He ran, model, yeah, he ran out at 15. Yeah, he ran out at 15. Oh, that was so scary from behind as well because Neil Andrews wasn't expecting him to be so slow mm. coming up in towards the entry. Had to take avoiding action down towards the inside there. Let's get a replay as well with Fabrice Cornelis. So this is on the run through Sunset Bend. Final lap of the motor race. And what? Probably best thing to look at is our overhead camera here. Fabrice comes into the corner. Oh, that was just a late, late move on the number four machine of Ilbrink. But then Cornelius, oh. I think Cornelius ran out of fuel as well. Final corner. Replay. He ran out of fuel. He, he got a slide coming through the exit. But I think he's okay on the fuel though. Let's listen in. Oh, just across the line. Yeah, so that slide happened. He expected the power to come on. The power wasn't there. And that car slowed as he thought he had basically more horsepower than he would. That's one of those weird things that these cars operate better with more power compared to when they're running at a slower, slower speed. The way downforce works. Downforce 101, Connery. Yeah, downforce. How does it work, Will? How does it work? <laughs> uh, downforce. Downforce, downforce. <laughs> no, but essentially what happened there, of course, is that exiting that final corner. If you expect to come out of that corner 130 miles an hour, you turn your steering wheel in such a way because you think you've got a certain amount of grip. But actually, the grip here is a number of different things. Mechanical grip and aerodynamic grip. If you've not got the wind going above the car, basically from the front wing all the way up the bodywork to the rear wing, then actually you're going to end up with less downforce, not more. And that's why a car is more likely to spin as it's running out of fuel. Tommaso Carla takes victory overall here then in terms of your race here tonight. Patrick Wolfe in second place, Marcus Hamilton third, Paul Ilbring fourth, Fabrice Cornelis running out your top five. Philip Barr in sixth place, Neil Andrews, Pascal Sticks, Casper Decourt and Frederick Evers rounds out your top ten. Two drivers out on pace two, Yavier Torres and Gabriel Perez. Over to GT1, Dave Geeling. We didn't actually show him crossing the start finish line, but he won by 35 seconds there, Connery. Incredible finish by him, claiming victory over Paul Sell. Third place, Josta Vries. Fourth place, Paul Ancliffe. Callum Freudant in fifth. Remainder of your GT1 results coming up on your screen for you now. See the biggest retirement, Fraser Williamson, earlier on in the event. And then finally, here's a look at the results in GT2. Cohen Klopman wins by 8.7, so no stage finish in the end then. Neil Sinkowski in second, Tim Adoika in third, DNS for Gilbert in the number 28 machine. 
Well, we're going to take a quick break here on RaceWatch TV and on iRacing Live. When we come back, we'll talk about the weekend. This is RaceWatch TV on iRacing Live. We'll be right back. The yellow flag is out. Pit road is now open. Keep your eye on those gauges. We'll give you four tires. Three, two, one, now. We're done, get going. Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen, to RaceBot TV and on iRacing Live. Well, I'll tell you one thing, Connor, we've not got as busy a weekend as what we've been having for the last two months or so. Pro Series of Road Racing is done and dusted in the books, and now we wait for the Irish World Championship Grand Prix Series, but we do have three more great races tonight. Red Bull Global Rally Class at Lucas Oil Raceway in Indianapolis, the World of Outlaws Late Models at Williams Grove, and the World of Outlaws Sprint Car Series at Knoxville. Yeah, exactly. With the Red Bull Global Rally Class, we say every week, can anyone beat Milk till the Young? Let's tune in this week to see if anyone can, but it's not looking very, very likely at all. We've got the World of Outlaws Late Models, which I actually have seen a little bit of, and those guys are just absolutely crazy. It's it's crazy racing, and actually not that many cautions as well. It's, it's absolutely fantastic. We've also got the sprint cars there, uh, which are their own thing, and uh, absolutely insane speeds on very, very low grip surface. I'm not sure how they do it. Yeah, then tomorrow night, we've got the Major Series, Classic 2.4. That'll be 5 p.m. GMT here on Racebot TV and on iRacing Live. The Sim Racing Grand Prix, Nordic style with Norwegian commentary. That'll be round number three at Suzuka, 5.30 p.m. GMT on Sunday. And then it's your pre-show to the Super Bowl. The Skip Barber 2K World Cup, round number three at Zandvoort, Connery. Yeah, Zandvoort is absolutely, it's an absolutely fantastic track. Uh, and it's a, a sort of track that I want to see on more series calendars. It's that good. It's that good to drive uh, with the elevation changes. You've got the various different types of corners as well. You've, it, it, it's just a brilliant circuit to race at. And uh, I'm excited to see what the Skippies can do around that. Exactly. 24 hours later, you've got yourself Monday Night Skippies running out your week's worth of action. Join Rachel Whiteford. That guy, Connery Maddock, and occasionally Linus Bontrum for Monday Night Skippies in support of the Calm Zone here on Racebot TV. That is all we have time for here tonight. We, will, of course, want to say thank you to the people that you'll see on your screen now. And Connery, guess what? What, Will? No one blew it tonight. No one blew it, apart from me being ill. And me being ill. Everyone's ill. And race bot cat being in heat. Yeah, but, but the thing is, these are issues that we can deal with. Yeah, uh, we, we, we're very, uh, we, 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 we're good at our jobs, apparently. Yeah, that's it. Thank you so much for watching, ladies and gentlemen. Friday Night Prime Time is off the air. Good night.